So today I will be presenting work from my group um, on cartilage regeneration by activated skeletal stem cells. This follows from our recent manuscript published in Nature Medicine, which explains how we were able to use the skeletal stem cell lens to learn about cartilage and particularly how to get cartilage, which is normally not a tissue that can regenerate itself, um, to actually uh, regenerate. So my presentation will be mainly about the topic of skeletal stem cells and the additional research that it led to, which led us to these discoveries. So I'm an assistant professor at Stanford in the Stem Cell Institute, uh, the, the Department of Surgery and First off, why are we so interested in skeletal stem cells? Well, it is potentially a way for us to understand how we are shaped the way we are. So there's not a lot that's known about the genetics of how shape is regulated at the cellular level. And so the cells that actually gives rise to the skeleton um, these are the skeletal stem cells, might be a way to give us a window into the genetics of how that occurs. And as organisms and the vertebrates grow, um, the overall skeleton also changes in terms of its shape. So one of the challenges that we are also trying to address is um, how do we stay in our optimum state, um, or at least keep the skeleton functioning the way it's supposed to, in our prime. And overall, you know, the skeleton is a very complex and interesting tissue, and we're, we're still trying to understand exactly um, their types of genes that's involved and when they are activated and how the overall process of skeletal genesis is programmed and controlled at the single cell level. Uh, moreover, because the an individual bone is actually a complex organ, composed of many different types of stem cells, uh, it also gives us an opportunity to understand how different stem cells communicate with one another in the context of complex organs. And if you were to think about it, an organ is basically a composite of many different types of tissues. And as it grows and it regenerates, their source of new tissues has to come from somewhere. And so most of these different types of tissues contain their own tissue specific stem cells. And so you can envision that these different types of stem cells within the organs, you know, must somehow have a way to communicate with one another in order to coordinate their activity and produce the proper ratio and types of cells. So our story in skeletal stem cells actually began with work on a different type of stem cells. Uh, that is the hematopoietic stem cell or the blood forming stem cell. This was first discovered uh, by Irv Weissman, uh, who with the help of the Hertzenbergs and Jerry Spangroot, uh, first isolated the hematopoietic stem cells now over 30 years ago. And since that time, um, they have, they and other investigators in the field have not only determined this identified this hematopoietic stem cells, uh, but also many of the intermediates through which this relatively undifferentiated cell can give rise to all of the complex cells of the blood and the immune system. And this would include such diverse cell types as red blood cells, erythrocytes, or um, T cells, or antibody producing B cells or macrophages. These are all structurally and functionally very distinct cell types. And yet at one point they were all derived from this uh, relatively multipotent self-renewing uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And the process through which this stem cell can give rise to these relatively highly specialized cell types is by producing 
these array of intermediate progenitors. By establishing the lineage relationship between the stem cell and their more mature cell types and characterizing their intermediate progenitors, uh, we can actually do comparative gene expression analysis to identify many of their uh, regulatory pathways that control how this stem cell turns into the specialized cell types of the blood and immune system. And so what you also see here in this diagram are the cytokine switches that controls at particular points uh, how the stem cell bifurcates into specific lineages. So this is basically a recipe for how you can make blood and immune cells. And my question initially in approaching this field is what is the source of these cytokines? Where does the regulation, external regulation, um, what cell types provides the external regulation for the blood forming stem cells? So to address this question, I looked into where hematopoietic stem cells reside in adult vertebrates. And so the majority of the hematopoietic stem cells in adult vertebrates resides in the bone marrow compartments. This is a cross section of the bone marrow compartments and you can appreciate from this cross section that it's made of many different types of tissues. So there are vessel forming tissues. There's vessels here. There's these white globules are adipocytes. And then there are many different types of blood cells. The bone marrow compartment is also uh, infused with uh, different types of neuronal cell types. And then there's these yellow bone um, cells. So there's many, many different types of tissues uh, within the bone marrow. And how do these different cell types coordinate with one another to form bones and to maintain hematopoiesis? So we were asking, what is the source of these cells? And so in order to address this question, um, where these, what is the identity of the different cell types that makes up this bone, this complex microenvironment, um, we used a technique called uh, flow cytometry. And this is a machine of a, this is a picture of this machine um, called a flow cytometer. And for you in the audience who are not familiar with this technology, you can just think of it as a high throughput jelly bean sorter. It gives us the ability to separate out the cells of a, a very complex tissues uh, individually by virtue of their expression of unique proteins on their cell surface. And the way that is done is um, every single cell, one of the reasons why that defines um, how it can respond to its environment and its behavior, um, has a lot of specific protein receptors uh, that is expressed on its cell surface. And it is possible to generate antibodies that are specific to these particular types of receptors. These antibodies could then be chemically cross-linked to fluorescent dyes. And then what you would have is you would have cells that are um, colored or dyed in a particular way by virtue of these fluorescent antibodies. And if you were to pass this through the cell sorter, uh, it has the ability to detect these colors. And moreover, once it detects these different populations, so this is just a diagram of how these different cell types from the bone marrow would appear in the sorter after they've been dissociated. Um, you can gate out these particular populations of cells with um, unique surface characteristics. For instance, in the red box, we can pick out cells that are positive for the thigh surface marker and then CD105. These are two different types of protein that are uniquely expressed on this red box population. And then when the sorter detects uh, these signals falling within the square, it would turn on these electromagnets and this would allow us to isolate out these unique cell types. Now, there have been many studies that have been done before on the topic of so-called mesenchymal stem cells, um, but there's very few studies 
that actually uses this approach to isolate out and characterize like mesenchymal stem cells. The way mesenchymal stem cells used to be characterized is on the basis of their ability to stick to plastic wear. Um, so if you were to take bone marrow aspirate and you were to culture it, they would form colonies um, and, and stick to the plastic as opposed to the blood cells, which you can easily washed off. This was the chief criteria for isolating skeletal stem cells in the past, but that is different from how we're isolating skeletal stem cells now. Um, which would, using this technique of flow cytometry, allows us to really, really pinpoint specific populations just based on what type of signaling receptors they are expressing. So with the aid of this technology, we were able to establish an assay, um, a functional test to determine the function of the various cell types that are within the bone marrow microenvironments. So this is just a schematic of the overall experimental process, but we would take bones and then we would um, dissociate it using mechanical dissociation and also digestive enzymes. And then we would stain it with specific antibodies. And then we would transplant these cells into a part of the body that normally doesn't contain bones. And that is the kidney capsule. There's another reason why we transplant cells into the kidney capsule. Um, and that's because it has a very, very tough membrane on top of the kidney parenchyma. And if you make a small incision on it, you can put a small pool of cells directly on top of a very vascular rich tissues. So whatever you transplant into this kidney capsule, there's a very good chance that it's going to be nourished by the underlying vasculature and survive. And so if we were then to isolate out cells, for instance, from a GFP mouse. This is a mouse where every single cell within the body is expressing green fluorescent protein. I'm sure you're all familiar with it because this is also uh, discovered by you know, Roger Chan and UCSD. Um, but uh, so this is basically uh, showing the phenotype of GFP blood vessels that we have isolated from the bone marrow growing in the kidney. You can tell their blood vessels because they're carrying these red uh, blood. And we have isolates out um, fat progenitors, adipocyte progenitors, also from the bone marrow. And this is the, this is the appearance of these luminescent adipocytes growing on top of the kidney surface. And lastly, there's a population of cells that we were most interested in, which gave us um, when transplanted onto the kidney, um, a piece of bone. And you can also tell that it's also a very uh, red piece of bone. The reason why it's red is because it has um, a small little marrow compartment within it. It's undergoing hematopoiesis. This is a uh, picture of another of these ectopic bones growing on top of the kidney surface that uh, the cells were isolated from a GFP mouse. And so all of the cells derived, all of the bones derived from these transplanted cells are green. If you were to take a cross section of this ectopic bone growing on top of this kidney surface now, you can appreciate that there is a marrow cavity. You can detect somewhat this marrow cavity by a CT scan, there's the vertebra. There's this little bone growing on the kidney with a little marrow cavity within it. And within this cavity, there is also uh, phenotypic hematopoietic stem cells that are KID positive, SCA positive, lineage negative. And it doesn't just appear to be hematopoietic stem cells. Are, these are also bona fide functional hematopoietic stem cells um, because like true blood forming stem cells, they have the ability to rescue um, mice after the host bone marrow compartment has been ablated by a lethal dose of irradiation. So we performed um, a bone marrow transplant uh, with these mice using these uh, stem cells that are found in these ectopic bones. So to summarize, there are different types of progenitor cells that are in the bone marrow. And one of these appears to be a type of bone progenitor. And it's unique in terms of its ability to make an entirely new bone complete with a microenvironment that can support another type of stem cell. These are the blood forming stem cell. So 
This system allows us to not only look at the cell types that are involved in formation of their bone marrow compartments or their, or their uh, microenvironment that supports blood formation, but also allows us to knock down specific genes. And we can look at the genetics of the process of bone marrow microenvironment formation and the beginnings of hematopoiesis in adults. But because these were at that time still a relatively mixed pool of bone progenitors, we ask, are these bone progenitors potentially containing another type of stem cell? And so working with Mike Longacre, uh, we ask, are these progenitors homogeneous? Or are they in fact composed of many other different types of stem or progenitor cells? So to address the question of whether or not there might be a stem cell, within this bone forming population, um, we used another type of genetic uh, model. These are the rainbow mice. What's unique about these mice is that it allows you to label um, every single cell in the, the mouse's body, right, a different color. Recall previously we were using an actin GFP mouse where every single cell in the mouse is green. Here, every single cell in the mouse is a different shade of red, green, blue, or orange. And in different combinations, you can get like the full spectrum of a rainbow. The way we're using this system is we're asking uh, where are there normal stem cell, um, are there any areas in the bone that contains um, telltale signs of stem cell activity? And one of these signs is the fact that stem cells can form colonies. So they'll give rise to daughter cells. So, and if this, if you were to look at um, stem cell activity in a rainbow mouse, what you might see are basically the presence of different colored colonies. And so looking at a cross section of a mouse, rainbow mouse uh, femur, you can see that there are indeed kind of colonies here in this area. So these are various strands of um, blue colored cells, red colored cells, orange cells. You know, these types of colonies are not round. Um, the skeletal colonies are actually uh, linear. They grow like in a row or like a ribbon. And what is also interesting is that they, you can see that in this area, this is the blow up of this area showing these individual rainbow clones. It's, there's actually two different types of tissues there, uh, one that stains blue and one that stains yellow. Uh, in this particular stain, yellow stains for bones and blue stains for cartilage. So this is an area where you can see clonogenic multipotent activity. There's two different types of tissues here that are both formed at some point from a uniquely labeled stem cell. So we then micro dissected out this region and using again this technique of flow cytometry, we were able to identify new surface markers that allows us to further fractionate these cell types that are within this area into actually eight different populations. We then tested the function of each of these individual populations by transplanting again into the kidney capsule. And what we saw was that there's at least eight different progenitors within this population and four of which gives rise to bone, one of which gives rise to cartilage, and three that can form bones as well as marrow through a cartilage intermediate. So this might represent many different types of stem cells or perhaps they, these might all be uh, intermediates of one another and they're all somewhat linearly related to one another. So we conducted additional experiments to see how these various bone forming or cartilage forming populations are related to each other by transplanting them and then re-isolating them at different intervals and seeing what other cell types they, that they gave rise to. And basically what we find is that there's this populations in E, which has these surface marker characteristics, which has the ability to give rise to all of these other cell types. 
Moreover, we determined that it also has the ability to make more of itself. So these are the eight different populations that we found that are um, organized in this uh, lineage map. So at the very top is the skeletal stem cells because we call it the stem cells because it has the hallmark characteristic of a stem cell, which is the ability to make more of itself and also multipotency it has the ability to give rise to other types of tissues. In this case, it's bone, uh, cartilage and stromal tissue. Um, however, we were not able to see um, that it can give rise to other bone cell types, such as blood vessels or fat. So it's lineage restricted to just bone, cartilage, and stromal cells. So we, after having isolated the skeletal stem cells in mice, we followed this work by isolating the skeletal stem cells in human, using the mouse skeletal stem cells lineage uh, map as a guide. And the way we did this initially, um, it follows from our finding that actually there was, um, we were at, at, at first stumped in our attempt because we found that the human skeletal stem cells actually do not express any of the markers that we use to identify the mouse skeletal stem cells. So some surface proteins are not conserved or expressed in the same way uh, in human skeletal tissues. So. In discussing this with Mike Longacre, um, he suggested that I follow a Sutton's law. And you might not have heard of uh, Will Sutton before. He's not a traditional type of scientist. You know, he's a very unique type of specialty. And um, he actually uh, cracks uh, banks, uh, cracks safes. So he's, he's a bank robber. And his famous saying is, go where the money is. So previously, since we have found that skeletal stem cells are enriched, at the growth plates, uh, we then ask whether or not we can find similar cell types in the growth plates of human tissues. And so indeed, using their technique of um, single cell RNA sequencing, we micro dissected out each of the different regions of a human fetal bones, um, and then conducted single cell RNA sequencing, and then we ask, are there populations of cells um, which, in terms of its shared gene expression, um, closely resembles the mouse skeletal stem cells? And indeed, there were several populations, and they had unique surface markers. And so using these new surface markers to find cells that contains the same type of transcription machinery and regulatory machinery as the mouse skeletal stem cells, you know, we were able to find a new panel of markers that allows us to prospectively isolate cell cartilage progenitors, bone progenitors, and the skeletal stem cells that forms all of these other cell types from human tissue. Um, this particular panel of markers allows us to isolate cell skeletal stem cells not only from fetal tissue, but also from adult bone marrow, skeletal stem cells that are derived from induced pluripotent stem cells, and also uh, ectopic bones that are formed under the influence of a very strong morphogen, um, BMP2. So now that we have identified the skeletal stem cells, what can we do with it? Well, one thing we might try is to see whether or not it gives us new insight in terms of understanding uh, skeletal disease. So first we wanted to ask, you know, can we apply the skeletal stem cell lens to looking at bone regeneration? And so a very talented student in the lab, Owen Marisic, who actually used to be a professional football player and played for the 49ers, um, he had decided to retire from football and taken somehow an interest in research. And, you know, he, for whatever reason, was very talented in breaking bones. And so he developed a model for us in mice uh, whereby we were able to test the role of stem cells in bone regeneration. And so he developed this bicortical uh, bone fracture model 
So you would break a bone and um, find the right size of pin and you can hold the bones together. And through the course of a month, um, the bones would, can completely regenerate by forming this uh, intermediate uh, callus tissue. And there you can see there, this regenerative bone callus forming. And also it corresponds to the appearance of the skeletal stem cells. What is also unusual is that the skeletal stem cells that was formed as a result of the fracture um, are very different from resting adult skeletal stem cells. So what Owen found is that if you were to compare normal adult skeletal stem cells, you were to transplant equal numbers of these skeletal stem cells into their kidney of the adult mice. Um, this is the size of bones that you would get from transplanting same numbers of adult skeletal stem cells uh, versus a much larger bone if you were to transplant the same number of skeletal stem cells that were isolated from newborn postnatal day three mice. So this indicates that in adults, the skeletal stem cells, as we get older, skeletal stem cells start to lose some of these skeletogenic uh, properties. But this is the types of bones that you would get from a fracture. And so you can see that actually these skeletal stem cells collected from these fracture callus has comparable skeletogenic activity as a newborn mouse and significantly more than the uh, unfractured, than the skeletal stem cells collected from uninjured bones. So somehow this process of injury and can induce an activation or reawakening of stem cells uh, within the body to the point where they can actually have tissue forming abilities or capacities similar to much younger stem cells. So this is just an overall quantification of the difference between normal adult uninjured skeletal stem cells and also uh, these fractured activated skeletal stem cells. So we see this injury activation in mouse bones, but do they also exist in humans? And in order to address this, we transplanted human limb tissue onto the backs of mice. And these were stably engrafted, become vascularized. And if you were to introduce a fracture in these bones, you will also see a corresponding increase in activated expansion of human skeletal stem cells. So this tells us that skeletal stem cells are not only important for formation initially of the skeleton, but it also plays a key role in helping um, the skeleton and bones regenerate. Uh, every single time we see these cells, uh, every single time there's a fracture, we see these cells. And if we were to ablate these cells, uh, for instance, with a dose of radiation, then the bones cannot heal. So now with this new skeletal stem cell lens, um, Tom Ambrosi and my group, in collaboration with Rahul Sinha, who's an uh, associate scientist at the Institute, started to look at human bone healing. So we were able to collect uh, many different fracture specimens from the orthopedic surgery department. And we were trying to figure out, you know, why is it that some of these patients are unable to heal their bones. So Malakaya is a very talented student in the lab, and she conducted a functional analysis from over 400 individual patients to determine differences in their ability to um, make bones. So you can see here that in the young, in skeletal stem cells isolated from young fracture specimens, um, they can make large amounts of bones. And so this is an in vitro way of looking at bone formation, uh, which in this particular assay stains red. Uh, so there's, you can see these skeletal stem cells can make very, uh, bones very efficiently in vitro. But in older patients, it has completely lost its ability to um, undergo osteogenic differentiation or, or make bones. So why is that? So in collaboration with an investigator uh, at UCSD, uh, Debash Sahu, and his student, uh, Sahar Tahari, we actually find that skeletal stem cells can potentially undergo a fibrogenic state. So 
young skeletal stem cells, human skeletal stem cells, when transplanted into um, the kidney or under the skin, can make a large piece of bones, as shown by this micro CT. But from aged skeletal stem cells, you know, they, they make a far smaller piece of bone and a lot more fibrous tissue. And that also corresponds clinically to the inability of these aged bones to heal, or, you know, they have this, um, it's, it's called, actually called non-unions. The bones afterwards are unable to heal in such a way that the fractured bones unite with each other. You do see a somewhat gradual corresponding decline in the frequency, age-related frequency of the skeletal stem cells, but the skeletal stem cells are still there. They're just unable to make the right types of tissue. Somehow, you know, they have uh, um, become skewed towards making fibroblasts. And so this, these are some of the um, pathways that we have able, been able to identify with the help of Debashis and his team. And we're now in the midst of trying to see if we can identify specific pathways that can reverse this um, age-related inability of bones to repair itself. Um, one possibility is that there is something within the skeletal stem cell microenvironment that is its niche that has been changed. So uh, working with Ruth Tevlin, who is a previous fellow in our group, we had just the question of why is it that diabetic patients tends to also display signs of poor fracture healing. And this is just a CT of the types of really aggressive fixation that you would need to hold a fractured bone together in a diabetic patient. So all of this is actually like metal. Um, but what we found is that skeletal stem cells in a diabetic patient significantly reduce its expression of a key gene called Indian hedgehog. And if you were to exogenously deliver this missing cytokine, then you can restore um, the normal levels of bone formation by these skeletal stem cells. The skeletal stem cells are there. They're just not able to make the right decision in terms of the tissues that it's supposed to form. If you were to apply this compound to um, diabetic mice and, and um, you can see that actually if you were to break their bones um, with the presence of this Indian hedgehog, you can actually not only restore their ability to make bones, but the healed bones have very similar mechanical um, strength as um, non-diabetic mice. So we have been using the skeletal stem cells to understand um, diseases in bones. But the skeletal stem cells, as I've explained earlier, also gives rise to uh, cartilage tissue. So now can we apply the skeletal stem cell lens to understand why is it that cartilage, unlike bones, um, can regenerate in adults? And if there's any way that we can perhaps unlock the ability of these skeletal stem cells to make regenerate cartilage. And so this is work done by a very, very talented uh, medical uh, fellow in the group, uh, Matthew Murphy, uh, who worked closely with a CIRM-funded scholar, uh, Lauren Kopke. And their work was recently published in um, Nature Medicine. And so basically what Matthew first asked is, using these rainbow mice that I have described previously, um, he then uh, asked the question, um, are there less skeletal stem cells in the joints of adult mice versus newborns? And so using this rainbow system, which again allows us to track stem cell clonogenic activity in vivo, you can see in the joints of newborn mice that there are many different individually labeled colonies on the chondral surface. So this is the surface of the bone and the surface of these bones are actually um, um, covered by a layer of cartilage tissue. And so this cartilage tissue, there's, there's, you can see that there's a many different clones of cartilage tissue there. Um, but it progressively, these clones goes away with increasing age. So from newborn to two weeks, you know, you've already lost a lot of these clones. So that by adults, you see hardly any clonal labeling at all. 
And so at first we were like saying, uh oh, well, that explains it. Uh, the reason why cartilage cannot regenerate itself in adults is because there's no skeletal stem cells left. But it turns out this was not true. So clinically, there is actually a technique that's used to repair large cartilage injuries or cartilage defects that a patient may experience. And this is the technique called uh, microfracture. And what it entails is that the surgeon, after they have debrided or removed much of their car damaged cartilage tissue, um, they would use a specific drill and drill holes to access the underlying marrow cavity. What then happens is that there's a, like a large bloody clot that forms. And this clot would then be replaced with what is so-called fibrocartilage. Um, although it's called cartilage, it's not actually cartilage formed from chondrocytes. It's actually a, more of a type of uh, fibrous uh, scar tissue. But what Matthew and Lauren found was that this scar tissue has a clonogenic origin. So using rainbow mice, he saw that there were these different clones that form. Some of these clones correspond to formation of blue labeling cartilage tissue. But some of these clones actually correspond to forming a white fibrous tissue. So that indicates that uh, potentially uh, skeletal stem cells do have the ability um, to regenerate cartilage. And even though there are very few skeletal stem cells left in joints in adults, right, you can still activate them. They can still respond to a local injury and expand themselves. And some of these stem cells could undergo a cartilage fate and some could undergo a fibrotic fate. So because we have now uh, solved this lineage relationship between the stem cells and the downstream progenitor cells with the help of the Bosch's and others, you know, we were able to identify specific pathways that controls aspects of how these decisions are made. First, we identify BMP2 as a method to encourage this self-renewal process. So when you apply BMP2 to skeletal stem cells in an injury setting, you get more skeletal stem cells. Um, second, we found that the process through which the skeletal stem cell commits to cartilage versus bone or fibroblastic stromal fates is highly dependent on VEGF signaling. This is a signal that is normally required for formation of blood vessels. And if you were somehow to block this signaling, then basically you have cartilage. So this is just to show um, how well these factors work in um, a mouse model of osteoarthritis. So this is a relatively large um, mouse normally don't actually develop osteoarthritis. We have to um, actually induce it. And this is a relatively aggressive way of intru introducing this type of um, damage. We, we just drill a hole on top of the surface of this joint. And then we would test different factors. So in this case, this is um, a large cartilage defect that we had to introduce onto the joint of a mouse. And then we would then transplant a little hydrogel that has no factors in it. And you can see that basically this, there's, there's still a hole there and, and there's, there's relatively little regeneration. If you were to add BMP2, then it starts to heal somewhat. But this healed tissue, as shown in this uh, cross section, um, actually stains yellow, meaning that the majority of their skeletal stem cells actually turned into bones. However, if you were to apply in this hydrogel both BMP and an antagonist to VEGF signaling, then you get this large piece of blue cartilage. And this cartilage is actually quite stable and it stains for all of the traditional markers of, of true cartilage, including agrican, collagen shouldn't too, and negative for so-called hypertrophic or transitional cartilage, uh, which is positive for collagen 10. So uh, this, this is just a cross section of an eight weeks um, new cartilage that's formed. Um, it's positive for agrican, collagen 2, negative for transitional cartilage markers such as collagen 10, and MMP13. It's stable up to um, 16 weeks. We actually haven't looked further. 
Um, but 16 weeks is actually like a quarter, four months, which is a quarter of actually a, a mouse's lifespan. So if you were to think a, a typical person can, let's say, live 100 years, then this, this, this cartridge in principle could last like at least 25 years. It not only has the surface marker, it doesn't normal, just look like cartilage, it also has the same mechanical properties as uninjured cartilage. And we were able to determine this using uh, atomic force microscopy. And so just looking at the cartilage uh, form that's with this uh, combination of BMP and VEGF inhibitor. Um, so it has very similar properties as uninjured cartilage. Moreover, it restores the ability of these mice to uh, carry on its normal activities. So we did a, a, a mobility test. This is called um, the gait analysis. So we just tested whether or not the mouse still walks the same way. Um, because if it was injured, then um, it would feel pain in their injured leg and then it, it wouldn't rest its um, it, it it would try not to use that leg as much. It would limp. Um, and you can detect this using this tool um, that allows us to analyze their, their gaits. And, the, and, and basically, you know, the gaits of these injured mice were restored with these factors. And it also dramatically reduced their pain. And you can access pain by the so-called grimace test. Um, so we weren't the ones who were, uh, who determined this, but basically um, mice that are undergoing like some agitation, right? They, you can tell because they narrow their eyes and they puff up their cheeks. Um, and so what we see is that dramatically uh, with, the com with this particular combination, not only do you eventually uh, form durable, stable cartilage that resurfaces this, this joint, but you also have a um, dramatic reduction of the pain um, just from day three uh, after the operation, post-operation day three. These factors also work in xenografted human uh, bone and joint tissue. So we apply the same combination of factors versus uh, hydrogel, which is PBS and its control. And again, we see durable formation of this cartilage on human tissue. So this is kind of a preclinical proof that these two compounds, both of which are actually FDA approved, um, so BMP2 is, uh, is, is FDA approved for spinal fusion. It's called Infuse. And VEGF inhibitors, um, there's a type of VEGF inhibitor called Avastin. Uh, it's used to treat um, cancer by blocking the ability of the cancers to uh, induce formation of new blood vessels. Um, so both of these are actually FDA approved and known to be somewhat safe, um, but they just haven't been used in this particular setting. Uh, so this would hopefully mean that um, there would be a shorter duration of time through which we can get this to the clinic. And so right now we're in the midst of trying different types of these combinations in larger animal models and with different scaffolds um, to establish uh, clinical proof that this is safe to use in larger animals before we start uh, clinical trials. So... Given the fact that um, many of us, uh, virtually all of us, if we live long enough, will eventually experience joint pains. Um, this actually has uh, attracted a quite a, a large degree of attention um, from the press. So, um, for instance, it was featured in uh, New York Times, and it's also uh, featured in Forbes. So... Um, you know, naturally, we're working as quickly as we can to uh, try and get this to the clinic um, by identifying additional factors that can make, make this work better by um, tinkering with the types of scaffolds that we will use and with the large animal testing to see, you know, whether or not, you know, how much cartilage do you, do you actually have to form to resurface the joints and various uh, and, and whether or not you have to change the combination for different types of joint. So just in summary, you know, we have been uh, able to identify the skeletal stem cells by a basic question that actually doesn't have anything to do with skeletal stem cells. We were trying to ask what is the origin of the niche cells, the supportive cells that um, nourishes the blood-forming stem cells.
So by probing this question, that allowed us to eventually identify this um, skeletal stem cells, which in mice and humans can form bone, cartilage, and fibroblastic stromal tissues. Uh, curiously, injury can induce a local expansion of stem cell, but these activated skeletal stem cells, although they have the ability to turn into all of the different types of skeletal tissues that skeletal stem cells normally give rise to, you know, they do require in adults specific signaling cues that has to be delivered into its microenvironment. And now this, this, our finding that stem cell induced regeneration can still occur in a type of tissue that normally was thought not to have any regenerative potential um, are leading us to ask, you know, are there these, is it possible that other types of poorly regenerative tissues such as um, the heart, you know, is it possible to, for instance, induce like heart regeneration or is this paradigm also um, potentially applicable um, to these other types of poorly regenerative tissue? And, and basically the point is that there are stem cells there um, and you can activate them perhaps by an injury cue, but you do need to supply additional guidance signals to its microenvironment to tell it to form the right types of tissues. So, you know, we are now in um, trying to actually also get at some of these, um, the source of these injury cues and trying to address how a local wound, uh, for instance, induced by surgery can stimulate regeneration. And so, you know, this is kind of like one of the grand champions of skeletal regeneration. regeneration. And now that we have shown that it's possible re to regenerate bone and cartilage, you know, people have been asking us, well, what about their entire limb? So, you know, we tell them the story about the axolotls, which is a type of salamander, which if you were to amputate its leg, you know, it can completely regrow a new limb. And this is also thought to um, involve skeletal stem cells. So we're in the midst of identified skeletal stem cells in axolotls and trying to compare it with human and mice to see if we can identify genes um, that are somehow could be applied exogenously you know, to, to further amplify or unlock the hidden uh, regenerative potential of human skeletal stem cells. And also, you know, we've been trying to kind of like look at the flip side of things, which is that injury and surgery can also possibly trigger unwanted uh, stem cell activity. For instance, um, metastasis. You know, if you go undergo a procedure, for instance, could this trigger expansion of tumor forming stem cells that are in your bones um, or other types of tissues. So this all leads us to now the realization that stem cells definitely uh, function in the context of one another. You can imagine that there is a type of social network between different types of stem cells within an organ. And perhaps, you know, some of the signaling that's involved can also reach uh, other organs. But if you were to block um, blood formation, you know, for instance, if you were to block bone formation, you would lose the ability to form the marrow compartments uh, in bones. If you were to block this VEGF signaling, you would also block bone formation and instead all the bones would turn into cartilage. And if you were to block blood formation in bones, then you can see from this cross section of a femur where their stem cell compartment, the blood forming stem cell compartment has been uh, ablated, then you have a lot of fat formation. So all of these different types of stem cells signal to each other to control not only how many stem cells a particular type of um, stem cell, how many, how much tissue a particular type of stem cells should form, but also within the context of the organ, um, uh, what types of tissue these most important stem cells should form. You know, and then that's all like very relevant to our understanding of diseases. So I'm running a bit low on time. So I, so, you know, the group is also involved in developing new spatial transcriptomics approaches, you know, with our uh, collaborator at UC SD, uh, Devash Sahu in the pediatrics and computational biology department. And so we're developing a method to analyze the local cellular microenvironments of um, skeletal stem cells. And this is another cross-section 
uh, this is a cluster of cells that is collected from uh, a micro fractured bones in those, these rainbow mice. And so we have developed a system that we can kind of break apart these cells, do single cell RNA sequencing, and match them together again um, so that we have a 3D map of what these cells are expressing and signaling to each other um, in response to injury cues. And, you know, as a new way to affect these type of regenerative environment, in addition to using hydrogels, um, one of the cell types that we found are frequently involved in, skeletal, in, in stem cell mediated regeneration is actually a mature type of blood cell. These are macrophages. So now we're also investigating as, um, if we can use CRISPR, um, which was newly awarded the Nobel Prize as, as, as Dr. Evans mentioned, you know, to use CRISPR as instead of using it to cut genes, we're using um, CRISPR mediated uh, transcriptional activation, CRISPR A, to see if we can turn macrophages that home or engineer macrophages that home to these injured tissues into local uh, factories for combinations of these factors uh, that can induce their uh, formation and the proper regeneration of different types of uh, tissues. So this is, I would like to acknowledge like um, the uh, many talented individuals in uh, our team and um, our many uh, various funding sources. Uh, I've already uh, mentioned that a lot of the computational work um, is done uh, through collaboration with Debashi Sahu. So, even though at the moment I'm not involved, with, uh, I'm not physically at San Diego, you know, definitely a part of me is still with uh, San Diego uh, through my collaborators. And all of this work, a lot of this work was funded by the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And hopefully I still have time for a few questions. That's great. Thank you. That was excellent. One question was, what kind of cartilage are you seeing? Uh, hyalin or fibroblastic? Hyalin. Hyaline cartilage formed by uh, chondrocytes. Okay. And uh, another question was, would you need to maintain the kinase milieu to preserve the growth of these cells? That's an excellent question. And that leads into this type of scaffold that we are developing, which uh, releases these different types of cytokines with different types of kinetics. So it depends the, on the amount of cartilage that we would like to form. For instance, if we wanted to regenerate a large piece of cartilage, um, we would have a scaffold that releases a lot of much more BMP2, which is a signal for amplifying the skeletal stem cells, more so than for an area that where we want to regenerate a thinner piece of cartilage. Um, and then we would release the second factor, which is the VEGF blockade, this VEGF inhibitor. So, you know, it's, it's very important to control both the temporal aspects and also the spatial aspects of these cytokines through these types of hydrogels. Great. The next question, I guess, is a more global question. Um, uh, it, you need to comment on the entire field of regenerative medicine. The question is, how close are we in terms of years to being able to develop fully functional, viable solid organs from stem cells for transplantation into humans? And if not solid organs, at least tissues like the GI tract or arteries or pr presumably parts of the musculoskeletal system. Uh, to be honest, um, I think it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of financial support. So, um, time in our world, in the research field could be accelerated. As many of you know, if we merely had the proper level of funding, if we had enough people working on our cartilage project, you know, we might have been able to do this and have it in clinics years ago. You know, but what I showed you was basically, you know, this took place over a span of like 18 years. Um, the recent cartilage work actually happened very quickly within like two and a half years. And, you know, thanks partly, you know, due to increased funding 
from agencies such as the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. You know, so if we have the proper amount of funding, um, then you know there are many investigators uh, who are working on whole organ um, development. Um, for instance, this is Hiro Nakauchi uh, at Stanford. Um, they can grow entire organs from stem cells for transplants. Um, moreover, other investigators like me are taking a different approach by rejuvenating the stem cells that are already present in your body and giving them the right signals that they get, so that they can uh, give rise to the right types of tissues. The questioner wants to know, uh, you've been speaking a lot about regenerating cartilage, and he was wondering about, uh, can stem cells be used in a, in a protective manner? In other words, for a soccer player, let's say, that you know is wearing down his cartilage throughout his career, is there some way to, to protect uh, against arthritis development? So, actu so we've actually been asked this question before too, and that, that's actually something that we would like to try. So, you know, um, uh, my collaborator and mentor, Mike Longacre, um, in response to this question, uh, said, yes, you know, we want to see if this can be turned into something like a Jiffy Lube. So every once in a while, you would receive a relatively painless injection or for people who intend to use their joints very much, right? Um, an injection of these factors, and that could spur the formation of new cartilage by those stem cells that are already there. And so, you know, Taking it a step further, you know, we might even be able to give you enhanced cartilage formation. You know, by tinkering with this composition, right, we can give you cartilage that has higher aggregate content, for instance, which would give the cartilage more um, um, elasticity, you know, so that, so that, you know, um, so that you can jump higher, you know. You know, perhaps we might even be able to, like, give you, like, Nike knees, <laughs> All right, I think we'll probably draw the Q&A to an end. Thanks so much, and we'll see you all next month.